Hi, it's Dwyer. It is Monday, October 11th, 2021. Gamblersadvisory.com, a free site. Bettingangle.us, a free site. For premium content, Dwyer70905.substack.com. Let's talk about a great fight that took place, folks. If things work out, this fight will help define this era. The Fury Wilder Third Fight. You know, that fight reminds us that great heavyweight fights sneak up on you. One of my favorite, the Lennox Lewis versus Vitaly Klitschko fight, in my opinion, featuring two of the three very best heavyweights of the last 25 years, was a replacement fight. Lewis, who had been on a tear, was to fight Kirk Johnson. Vitaly steps in at the last minute. It was magic. Both were the toughest opponent the other had ever faced. It removed all doubts as to either fighter's toughness. The underdog started fast. As I watched that fight, I could not breathe. Right, Lewis was tested. Right? The only regret is that that fight ended way too soon. In an earlier generation, the public was hyped. Maybe more hyped than it was for any other fight in my life. For the first Fraser Ali fight. I was a little kid. I remember. I remember the buzz. But let's face it. Ali got dominated. One judge had him losing 11 of the 15 rounds. Another judge had him losing nine of the 15 rounds. Right? Fraser comes out. Fraser's throwing a lot of left hooks in that first round. Then we get to the second fight. Understand, the second fight, neither guy had the title. Right? The second fight would be like two guys who had the title having some consolation match. That second fight didn't feature any knockdowns. Right? Then you get to the third fight. We thought that Fraser was past his prime, right? Fraser gets the third fight in Manila by beating, I believe it's Jimmy Ellis, right? Ali had beaten Foreman, who of course had destroyed Fraser. What we ended up with in the thriller in Manila remains the gold standard of heavyweight boxing. Folks, if there's one heavyweight fight that you should see in my opinion it's the thriller in Manila right let's talk about another series of fights you know in one of the great championship bouts Riddick Bowe beat Evander Holyfield folks that fight's a classic but understand we viewed Holyfield with suspicion after all he had been a cruiserweight right you had the rematch both seemed to be picking up steam. Then you had a paratrooper land in the ring. I wish I were making this up. Fan man or land by the ring. The fight restarts. It's controversial. Holifield wins the fight. You get to the third fight and folks, that's a classic. That's one of the best heavyweight fights I've ever seen. The third fight is a shootout. For years, the phrase Bo Holifield meant heavyweight boxing at the highest level. Classic boxing. Well, Saturday night was a classic. Both of these men, like Lennox Lewis and Vitaly Klitschko, like Ali and Fraser, like Riddick Bo and Holifield, are now intertwined. While Fury was the victor, both men won the night. If both men continue winning, if both men continue to put on world-class performances and don't have Andrew Galata detours, which Riddick Bo did, then this fight will be remembered 30 years from now. It will overshadow much of the era 
right? Let me point out that this era had a great heavyweight fight, the first Joshua Klitschko fight. But understand, that fight has been a little diminished because the guy who beat Klitschko when Klitschko was champion reappeared on the scene, right? Because the guy who won the Joshua Klitschko bout had a setback against Andy Ruiz, then had another setback against Alexander Usyk. So that fight has lost a little bit of its luster. This fight, there were doubts going in, major doubts, on whether Deontay Wilder was a Hall of Famer. I mentioned that I thought he was a Hall of Famer, a five-year reign as heavyweight champion is huge. The number of defenses he's had is huge, especially the manner in which he has defended his title. Mostly stoppages, right? But until last night, there were questions about his toughness. There were questions about the quality of his opposition, right? The feeling was that this guy was a puncher. He wasn't a craftsman. People even questioned his toughness, right? When a guy's winning fights by KO, you don't really know how the guy would react if he himself got dropped. His last fight against Tyson Fury seemed to confirm what we suspected, that when he hopped in the ring against a world-class fighter, he might be outclassed. He might get discouraged. The idea that his costume was too heavy, that his water was spiked, that his own corner supposedly stabbed him in the back, um, that the towel should not have been waved, made him look like a sore loser. So we get to the third fight. It's not even a fight Fury wanted. Fury wanted to fight Joshua. Wilder had to go to court. Let me tip my hat right here to Al Heyman and to Shelley Finkel because they enabled this fight to happen. So understand, the fight starts, it's in Las Vegas, there were surprises. The beginning of the fight is a jaw dropper. Deontay Wilder, both men, the heaviest they've ever weighed, comes in and starts going to the body as only a guy who's six feet seven inches can. Wilder has ring coverage. Wilder seemed to be several feet from Tyson Fury, but seemed to be able to dip low, throw jabs to Fury's body. Fury seemed caught off guard. Fury did not have an answer. Wilder also seemed to have looked at his game, right? Maybe he started remembering what Mark Breland tried to tell him. Maybe he himself looked at films and thought, hey, I need to tighten up some things. Every fight might not end in a stoppage. Maybe his new trainer, Malik Scott, came in and said, hey, player, what have you been doing? We need to tighten this up. And maybe he trusted Malik Scott. Maybe his sparring partner, who had a great night, Robert Hellenius, an underdog in his fight. We took him. He delivered, right? By the way, side note, Frank Sanchez also delivered last night, right? So it was a good night. But maybe his sparring partner pushed him. And maybe Wilder realized he had to do some things differently. So here he is in with Tyson Fury. And folks, he's throwing volume. In the same way in which Joe Fraser against Ali in the first round of their first fight is throwing a lot of left hands trying to end it early. Here's Wilder throwing a lot of right hands, and Wilder's not waiting. Wilder's stepping forward. Wilder also isn't waiting for everything to be perfect before letting his hands go. Here it's muddy, right? He has a fighter bouncing into him, making things difficult. That's not deterring Wilder. 
right? Wilder comes out, Wilder's aggressive with volume. He's throwing home run shots. He's hitting Fury in the body. He's trying to come up top with straight right hands. Also, the shock of the night for me is that Wilder now seems able to shorten that right hand. It's clear that Wilder, who did not look like he had an ounce of body fat on him, had spent his time between the last fight and now sharpening his game. It showed. I thought he won the first round. The fight had other surprises. It had Fury, in my opinion, playing Russian roulette. Understand, the first fight, Fury's dancing away. The second fight, Fury's staying away, he's measuring Wilder. You see him stick out his hand several times to make sure he has the proper distance between himself and Wilder. This fight, He's staying close to Wilder even as Wilder throws big bright hands. Fury's even throwing a left jab as Wilder's throwing right hands. Understand how high risk that is. The Wilder right hand would come in on this side and Fury, rather than keep his hand home, Right? Look at the first round of Usyk Joshua. You'll notice Usyk has his left hand parked. Right? He's conscious of Joshua's right hand in the first round. Here you have Tyson Fury using his left hand. He's a sequencer here. He's figured out that if he throws that jab at the right time, it's going to throw off. Wilder's right hand. So he's hitting Wilder with a jab as Wilder's loading up on right hands. Right? Well, you saw Fury slowly solving the puzzle. By the time you get to the third round, Fury understands that he has a safe harbor. If he gets up close to Wilder, and if he puts his head on the left side of Wilder's chest. Wilder can't hit him with his right hand and Fury's right hand is free. So Fury does exactly that. Understand Fury also knows that if Wilder is backing up, Wilder doesn't have offense. Let's sound a little bit hard. So, when Wilder starts to move backward, Fury is moving forward. So, the knockdown in the second round, Fury has Wilder up on the ropes. We're only three rounds into the fight. Wilder's up on the ropes. He gets hit with a Fury right hook. Right? As Wilder then staggers to the middle of the ring. Fury hits him with another right hook, and Wilder goes down. When Wilder gets up, he's a shell of himself. Or so we thought. The fight looked over. Then the fourth round happens. Folks, this is the kind of round that makes reputations. Wilder comes out still doesn't look to me to have his full balance but yet he's determined right he's just been on the canvas he's lucky that it happened late in the third round he comes out for the fourth round and you understood even if you're a wilder critic that this guy was firmly convinced that he was the best heavyweight in the ring Right? This guy was not going to stop until you stopped him. One knockdown was not enough. Wilder starts the fourth round and he's still being aggressive. Now it's speculation on my part. I thought Fury gets the better of the first two minutes of the round. 
Now it's speculation on my part, but I believe Fury is reading Wilder's movement. Right? When Wilder starts to back up, folks, he doesn't really have a back foot. That's when Fury dives in and tries to open up. But here, and I don't know whether Wilder did this by happenstance or whether Wilder has looked at a lot of old Sugar Ray Robinson films. I'm not sure. But Wilder's backing up, then he pivots. Right? He has his right leg in back of him. And he stops backing up and instead he leans into his left leg and he gets off a shorter right-handed punch. Now I'm not sure if Fury realized by this point in the fight that Wilder had figured out how to shorten that right hand. The punch hits Fury so violently and Fury is so unprepared that folks don't go by the facial expressions. Many of these boxers, including Fury, have poker faces. Right? These fighters know how to look calm and casual even as they're hurt. The giveaway on the scene is how Fury hits the canvas. He gets hit with a right hand. Fury leans back. Then he falls forward on the canvas. He can't keep himself up. His knees hit the canvas. His chest hits the canvas. He falls down awkwardly on the canvas. This is the first knockdown. Folks, I'm just here to tell you, Fury's badly hurt. I know he looks at referee Russell Mora. I know his face is a poker face. He looks like, okay, I've been buzzed. He looks a little disgusted. He stands up. He still doesn't have his legs. In my opinion, that first knockdown is the punch of the fight. So Wilder comes over. Now you see who Wilder is. He's alpha. He has a man hurt. Wilder comes over. He's going to end the fight right here. He hits Fury with the right hand. Fury goes down. This time, Fury can't even maintain the poker face. Now I know, after the fight, guys are going to say, hey, I was buzzed. But I was alert. I heard the breath clearly. I knew what was going on. I got up. I continued. I wanted to fight. That's always the after fight claim, isn't it? What I want people to do is to look at that fourth round again. The second knockdown. When Fury gets back up, Russell Mora, who does an A-plus job, goes over to Fury and is talking to him. I'm just telling you, Fury's still woozy. He does not get all of the conversation. Russell Mora has to repeat himself. If there were more time left in the round, if Fury wasn't able to just survive that interaction and then go to his corner, basically, Folks, he could have lost. I thought Fury was going to win this fight. Fury delivered. I'm not here complaining. I'm not going to look a gift horse in the mouth. But let's just say, woo, he came this close to losing the fight. When he gets off the canvas the second time and you see him blowing his nose and trying to clear his head, you know his head's not clear. Now it's because this is a great fight that we get the fifth round on that we get Tyson Fury somehow able to come out for the fifth round with some lucidity right you notice that Deontay Wilder can't match Fury inside Right? Fury knows he has a safe harbor. You notice Fury defensively can turn away from right hands. He's starting to time it. And he's able to make his head adjacent to his shoulder. Fury has a lot going on with his shoulders in this bout. 
you'll notice he's able to turn away and have it so that the punch can't hurt him that much right you uh, notice that on the outside Fury is able to get his wits about him again and his sense of timing post knockdown to actually get back to throwing that left jab let me also say too there are very few in the sport who can match Fury when it comes to roughhouse tactics now in this fight Russell Mora warns Fury about putting 6-7 Deontay Wilder's head under his underarm. But yet you notice Fury, who's a master at it, right? The people who are masters always make it look like it's happenstance. Like the other guy just happened to bend over and his head just happened to end up here. You notice Fury, the very next round, has Wilder's head under his underarm. Let me also say, too, that defensively, it's simply no contest. In other words, Fury's jabs are landing on Deontay Wilder, who is halfway beaten up most of the fight. Right? You notice Wilder doesn't have the reflexes. Wilder doesn't have the head movement to even respond to some of the shots that Fury's throwing. You notice too that when Fury bullies Wilder over to the ropes, Wilder cannot prevent Fury from doing so. In other words, Wilder's not the guy who can pivot and stay in the middle of the ring. Right? He's not that guy. He's a guy who if the right hand doesn't land and he's tired the bigger man who outweighs him by a lot of weight, right? Fury comes in 277, is able to jump in at opportune moments and back him up to the ropes. So what we get, and it's educational, for me at least, is a great fighter with a big toolkit showing you the importance of fighting inside showing you the importance of what happens in boxing between the punches showing you that he knows how to clinch a guy in such a way where his right hand is free and he's able to hit the guy with murderous right hooks who also shows you how he can get off heavy punches while he's standing practically straight up. In other words, you can't crowd Tyson Fury. Tyson Fury is always able to get leverage on uppercuts, on right hooks, even as he has you literally right next to him. So this fight eventually becomes a runaway for Tyson Fury. After Fury clears his head, after Fury figures out the lay of the land, he's out muscling Deontay Wilder, and he's doing a lot of that on the inside. Now, for those of you handicapping a future fight between Fury and Usyk, right? If Usyk gets by Joshua in the rematch, understand I believe Fury is going to have to fight that fight inside right Usyk has great legs as does Tyson Fury but I believe Fury understands you cannot give Usyk an opportunity to box you have to take the boxing away from him and turn the fight into a street fight where your bigger size and ability to fight inside roughhouse style and to throw punches with leverage up close will matter right let me also give fury credit for the assortment of punches he throws right over time 
Wilder starts to realize the right hand is coming. So then Fury is able to just drop a shoulder and get nice short uppercuts to land. Right? When you see a big man who can roughhouse on the inside, it doesn't come across on television as compelling as it is. What I want people to do is to focus on Deontay Wilder. Folks, he's done late in this fight. Understand, he gets dropped in round 10. He gets up, continues to round 11. It's a heroic performance. You have to admire the guy's bravery, his courage. But in round 11, when he gets dropped, let's just say I was grateful the referee stopped the fight. Right? It was clear to me that Deontay Wilder was risking major injury by continuing the fight against a guy who got sharper and sharper the more this fight went along. So let me applaud both guys. I believe we're going to remember this fight as a fight between two Hall of Famers many years from now. Let me just say, you heard me mention that two of the three best heavyweights, in my opinion, the very best of the last 25 years are Lennox Lewis and Vitaly Klitschko. The third is Tyson Fury. He already showed you that he's better than Vladimir Klitschko. Right? I don't believe a Fury-Klitschko rematch, which was scheduled, which both guys wanted before Fury had some personal problems, would be competitive. Right? He showed you in this fight the kind of heart he has. Right? I'm telling you he is badly hurt when he goes down the first time against Deontay Wilder. Just look at how he hits the canvas, folks. He falls like this. Then he goes down the second time. Look at the look on his face. Now I give Russell Mora credit. Mora understood. This was a trilogy fight. This was a heavyweight championship fight. Right? Even though both guys, to me, looked woozy when they got off the canvas. Mora lets Wilder continue in rounds 3 and 10. Mora lets Fury continue after getting dropped twice in round 4. As a result, we have a classic. As a result, we got to see Tyson Fury's game on the inside against a 6'7 guy who he outweighed, who didn't quite have as big a toolkit as Fury had. Right? This is a classic fight. If both guys continue fighting, and if both guys continue to be world class, continue to win, or continue to have fights like this against other opponents where they showcase their bravery, their punching power, their savvy, their skill set. This is going to be one of the defining fights of this era. Right? Let's look ahead here just for a moment. Now Otto Wallen, and it's an interesting fight folks, Otto Wallen is going to fight Dillian White. Right? That's going to be an intriguing fight. Understand, as I see that fight, and we'll talk about it in another video, Valen, who should have already been awarded the heavyweight championship from Tyson Fury. Right? Let's face it. Fury is bleeding badly. At times, it looks like you're in an emergency room. Right? Fury's bleeding badly in that Valen fight. Let's just say Vitaly Klitschko wishes he had the referee from that Valen fight for his fight against Lennox Lewis. Right? That fight easily could have been stopped. Valen easily could have been declared champion. Well, understand, Valen has the skill set to stay outside 
against a more immobile white. Right, Valen has the jab. We saw that in the Dominique Brazil Otto Valen fight. The question is whether Valen, who is one of the better athletes in the heavyweight division, has the execution. Because understand, White is highly skilled. Right? White, excellent body puncher, excellent jab. Very savvy in the ring. Well, let's just say if the Valen White fight happens, right? I think because of his mobility. I think Valen would give Fury some problems. Right? Understand how Fury beats him. Fury's bleeding. Fury has to come inside. When Fury faces adversity, he gives up trying to dance away. He comes inside. Right? This time, the question's going to be, would Valen be prepared? The Dylan White fight, I believe, is an easier fight, but Fury's now in his 30s. Fury couldn't fight White like he fought Wilder. Because if you come inside on White, White knows how to handle himself on the inside. Right? Where White would have a problem with Fury is in Fury's superior legs, right? Fury could turn that fight into a length contest where Fury's outside hitting the guy with the jab, throwing power punches from too far away for White to counter, right? I don't know what happens next for Deontay Wilder. What I hope Wilder does, because there's going to be somebody on the outside looking at heavyweight championship matches. If Usyk beats Joshua, then maybe we have Wilder against Joshua, a fight that's overdue by several years. Right? You know, whoever loses the Dylan White, Valen fight, would be an excellent opponent for Wilder. That's if Wilder, at 35, after taking a lot of punishment and after having millions and millions in the bank, decides that he's going to continue his boxing career. Right? That's an open question. If Wilder decides to retire, folks, he's a sure fire Hall of Famer. Understand, he just faced an unbeaten champion. No one has tested Tyson Fury, not even John McDermott, as much as Deontay Wilder has, right? This trilogy is going to catapult both guys. We thought the two knockdowns in the first fight were the result of Tyson Fury being out of the ring and just getting himself back into shape. There's no such alibi for this third fight. Right, he got caught, he got dropped twice. He thought he was going to be fighting Anthony Joshua. He's been healthy now for some time. He's supposed to be a gym rat by reputation. He has sparred with countless guys. Right, no, no. Tyson Fury got dropped by Deontay Wilder because Deontay Wilder is one of the premier punchers of our time. That's how I see it. Let me hear from you. I hope you leave your comments in the comment section of this video. Folks, this was Bo Holifield, circa 2021. Outstanding fight. I applaud both men. Both of their profiles have been raised. They've made both of themselves proud. I believe future generations of fight fans are going to remember what happened Saturday night. That's how I see it. I look forward to your comments. Thanks for stopping by.